Okay, so hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to backtest the stochastic trading system presented by Rainer Thieu. These are the trading rules, so let's go over them together. Of course, I recommend to check out Rainer's video beforehand. I will link it in the video description. So we are trading stocks in the Russell 1K. And the stock should trade above its own 200 day moving average. Also, the 10 period stochastic or the K line should be below 5. When those two conditions are fulfilled, we are placing a 3% buy limit order. We are exiting when we are on a higher close or after 10 trading days. Sounds easy? It's quite a challenge in Python. And that's what this video is about. It is just a Python implementation of the strategy, nothing more or less. So let's get right into it. All right, so let's get started. We need Y Finance to pull asset prices, TA to calculate technical indicators, Pandas for data handling, and Matplotlib to visualize our trading strategy. Next, we are going to pull stock price data for HRB. I'm taking this stock simply because Rainer was also using it in his examples. And we are starting in the beginning of 2020 ending up with a data frame containing open high low close data. And next we are going to calculate the technical indicators by simply adding two columns to this data frame containing the indicator values. I'm doing that within a function here. So calling that indicators, taking a data frame as an argument. And now I'm adding two columns. First, the 200 day simple moving average using the TA library, trend functions and pick the SMA indicator on the close column with a window of 200. Similar logic for the stochastic K line, adding a column stochastic K, use the TA library momentum functions, pick the stochastic RSI K on the close and a window of 10. As I'm getting any N values with that, I want to drop them and in place those values. Calling this function on our data frame and print out the data frame again, you see we are getting the data frame with two new columns, SMA200 and Stochastic K. And next we want to add another column containing true values if both conditions are fulfilled and false values if they are not fulfilled. All right. And again, the conditions where the close should be above the simple moving average. And also the stochastic K should be below five. Now important here, the stochastic K from the TA library has a scale from zero to one. And Reyna was using a scale from zero to 100, right? So if you don't believe me, I can show you. If I'm taking the max of this uh, column, you will see I'm getting a one. If I'm taking a minimum of this column, you'll see I'm getting a zero. So the scale is from zero to one. And we have to amend the condition for that. So if Rainer was using a five and we have a zero to one scale, we simply have to check for a stochastic value being below 0 0.05, okay? Because different scales, all right? So let's add a column here by containing true and false values. So by, and now we are checking the conditions. First, as I said, close should be above simple we average 200 and also stochastic K should be below 0 0.05. And with that, we are getting a new column here, right? Containing false values if both conditions are not fulfilled and true if both conditions are fulfilled. All right. The next block of code is containing a lot of stuff. So let me go through the logic of that with you together beforehand so that you can better follow along. Let's take a look at the first, let's say 25 rows of this data frame. And we are starting here where we have our first true value in the buy column. And in this row, we are considering to place 
a 3% by limit order, meaning we have to place an order which is 97% of the current close, right? So let's actually type that in here. So we're taking this times 0 0.97. So this is our target price where we are buying the asset, okay? So whenever we have a true value here, we are looping and then we are checking when we are hitting this target value or this limit value where we are buying the asset. And I'm using a, the following logic for that. I'm looping over the rows from this true row on and I'm looping over the low column because whenever the low is equal or below the target value, I know that my order was going through. So let's check that. Not the case, right? Is above this value. Not the case, not the case, not the case. Here is the first time the value is below this value, right? 16.992 and we have 16.90 here, right? So here my order is being placed. So here I'm buying the asset. Okay, and I'm buying the asset for exactly this price here. This is my price where I've placed my buy limit order, right? And I simply know that in this row, I know that the order has been placed, right? Because the low is below the target value. Makes sense, right? So I'm buying for this price and then from this row on, I'm checking if the close is above this buying value. So this one here, 16.92. In this case, so here, in this case, you see that it is already the case in the next row here, right? So I'm going to sell the asset on this day but I cannot do it on this day because otherwise I would have a forward-looking bias because I only know it in the end of the day. So I'm selling on the next day's open. So I'm selling for this price, all right? So this is our first trade. And the logic remains the same. Then we are checking for the next buy value and, and doing it um, over the whole data frame, all right? Furthermore, so imagine you have a true value here and a true value here. So we have two subsequent true values. We are checking if the buying date is above the selling date, right? We will implement that in the code structure as well. This is avoiding overlapping positions. Okay, so let's get started with the code block. So we are creating some empty lists. We have buy dates, sell dates, and we have buys and sells where we are storing the buying and selling prices here. And now I'm creating a placeholder variable for the very first buy date. So this is last sell date, and this is simply taking a date which is going um, way back in the past, right? So I'm just taking the beginning of the uh, 20th uh, century here, right? And this is simply for the very first buying date because in the second trade, as I said, I'm checking is my buying date, my new buying date above the last selling date. So the last sell date will always be the last value in this list. But for the initial uh, value, this has to be below the buy date. So I'm simply taking a date uh, way off here, right? And now I'm doing what I just explained. So I'm looping for row in the range, uh, range of the whole data frame. And first I'm going to take care of this logic here. So I'm simply checking, is my sell dates list um, empty or does it contain elements? So I'm simply taking, if the length of my sell dates is larger, then zero, which isn't the case in the very beginning. I'm reassigning this last sell dates value 
to the last element of my cell dates list. All right. Okay, so we have taken care of that one. And now we are finally checking for the uh, by column in our data frame and check for the true values. So we are checking the fi log for the row the iteration is currently in and then the by values. So if, if that contains a true value, so you can also take if that is true, but this is redundant code. So this is checking for the true values. And now we are locking in the buy price. And the buy price, as explained, is simply the close in this row times 0.97, right? 3% by limit order. And now we have locked the buy price and check for those low values or the low column in the next rows, right? And check if this low is smaller or equal to the buy price, right? And we are going over the next rows, but we don't know when this will happen, right? So we are first creating a counter variable here, k, and this is just the rows we are, uh, we are going over. So first we are starting in the next row, right? Then it is one. Then we are incrementing the k by two in the next iteration and so on. And this is what I will code here. So I'm defining an endless loop because I don't know when the low will be smaller or equal to the buy price. And now I'm checking if my buy price is larger or equal to the low. So I'm screening for iLog the row plus k because this is the row where I'm currently in, right? Um, here is my true value. And from then on, I'm checking the next rows, right? So this is why I'm using this. And I'm screening for the low value. And if that's the case, so if my buy price is uh, above or equal to the low, then I know that I can buy or I have bought the asset using a buy limit order. So I'm locking in my buy date uh, by simply taking I log of row plus K and then the name. So just as an explanation why name here, quickly showing you if you are screening a data frame here, let's just take the very first one here and take a look at the name. You see that you are getting the timestamp of this row, all right? So this is simply locking in the timestamp of the buying date. Okay, and when I've done that, when this condition is fulfilled, I want to break out this infinite loop here, okay? What you also have to take care of is that it might be for low volatile assets, let's say, that the buy limit order is never being triggered. So Rayner did not explicitly mention this, but this will be a problem for some assets. So I'm limiting this uh, uh, loop to 10 iterations, okay? But you can play around with 5, 20 or whatever you find um, making sense for you. You can also take, uh, uh, leave this out, but you will see that you are running into problems because there are some by limits or by limit orders never going through for some assets. So I'm limiting that to 10 iterations. So if my K is larger than 10, I also want to break this loop. Okay, and finally, I have to increment my K by one so that I'm getting in the next row. Okay, so just as a recap, where are we now? We are at the point where we have screened for a true buy value, locked in the buy price as 97% of the close value in this buy equals to true row. And then we looped over the next 10 rows and checked if our low is below or equal to this buy price, right? And if that's the case, we have bought the asset. So we have bought and now we have to check if our buying date, which we have logged in here, is actually above our last selling date, right? So in the very first iteration, it is just this timestamp, right? So we have a buying date and 
this will go through this check, but for the next situation, you have to do the check. So if my buying date is above my last sell date, then I want to append to my buying dates list, right? So I only have um, non-overlapping positions, right? I only have a buying date and a matching selling date. So also I'm, buy, uh, I'm appending the buying price to my buys list here. All right, okay, so this is just that we have it stored somewhere. And now whenever I'm doing that, I wanna check for the selling conditions. And as I said, now I'm looping over the next 10 rows and check if my close is above my buy price, right? So I'm simply taking a 4J in range loop here from one to 10, 11 because the 11 is excluded in Python. And now I'm checking if the FI log, and now I'm taking the row plus K because this is where my buy limit order was placed plus the J. So this would be the next row in the very first iteration, starting at one here. If the close value is above my buy price, then I want to sell. So I'm storing my sell price to the FI log same logic here, row plus K plus J. And then very important, add a one here to avoid a forward looking bias. So we can only buy on the next day's open and take the open value. This is my sell price. And similar logic for sell date, just screening the name of that series. Okay, and then we are appending to our cells. So the sell price to the sales list and the sell date to the sell dates list here, right? And whenever that is happening, so it could happen in the very first row, then we wanna break this loop, right? So if that is happening in row one, two, three, four, doesn't matter, but whenever it will happen, we have to break out this loop. Now it could happen that we don't get this condition fulfilled then we have to check for the very last iteration. So I'm taking, if my J is 10, then I also want to append to my sell list because I want to sell after 10 trading days. This was the condition. So if that's not happening, I want to um, sell anyways. So I can simply copy paste this code block here because this is the same logic, right? Okay, so this is the whole uh, uh, code structure. So yeah, as you see, a lot of code. I've also done that with functions, but this is even more complicated. So I think this is the most intuitive way to understand this. But if you're interested in the function logic, I can upload it uh, to the drive, let, just let me know. Okay, that's it for the code block. So let's execute this. And with that, we are getting some lists. So we are getting buy dates here. And now you remember, this is our, our buying date from the very first example here, right? And this is our selling date, the 2nd of November. And as you see, we don't have overlapping positions, matching trades, so buy dates, same length as the selling dates. And yeah, now we could plot our signals. So simply plotting the close of the asset. Uh, also plotting the um, uh, buying and selling uh, dates. So taking a scatter plot here and now screen the data frame for my buy dates. And then the index. So let me show you what this is doing that you understand what's going on here. So I'm passing this list of buy dates to my uh, log function and then simply take uh, the index here. So I'm just getting uh, the rows of this data frame um, which contain the buying dates, right? So this is my X axis and my Y axis is the close of the buying dates. Taking a fancy marker here 
and the color green for a buying signal and same logic for the selling signals here, right? So sell dates, sell dates, uh, set the color to red and the marker to a, a downward looking V or carrot, whatever you want to call it. And with that, as you see, we are getting the uh, price chart of HRB and the buying and selling signals. And as you see, we are capturing the trade Rayna was mentioning, right? So we have a confirmation that this is actually working. All right. And yeah, next we want to do the profit calculation. So I'm going to define profits here. And let's take, as we have two lists here now, our buys list contain the buy prices and our sales list contain the sell prices. Let's do some fancy Python stuff uh, using the zip function. So I want to do a calculation. I want to take the sell, the selling price, subtract the buying price and set that in, in relation to the buying price, right? This is just the profit of my trade, excluding trading fees, of course, not covered in this video. So we can do that with, with a zip function. So we can take a list comprehension, uh, yeah, a list comprehension and take sell minus buy and divide that by buy, simply my profit, right? Selling minus buying in relation to buying is my relative profit for sell buy in zip sells buys, right? So I'm just taking every element here and subtract element wise and set element wise into relation, right? So pretty fancy um, function here. So if that's too complicated, you can also take the division here um, and you will see that this is simply the, the first element here. So seven, uh, uh, 17 minus 16 point something. This is this value here, right? And then we are setting it into relation to the buying value. So again, divided by buy. And this is our, these are our profits. And we can just take this now and store that in a data frame. So PD data frame and pass the fancy list comprehension and have our profits in a data frame, right? And we can apply uh, pandas methods now to calculate, for instance, the cumulative profit. So I've covered that in other videos, just add a one to the profit and take the cumulative product here. And as you see, we actually lost on HRB. So even though this trade looks awesome and this also, we lost some stuff probably in the beginning, not probably, we can check that in our profits list. So we are starting making losses and then starting to win again. So if you wanna have the profits itself, you can just take it like so. So profit, big loss, loss, good profit, good profit, ending up uh, with, uh, yeah, with a bad strategy, at least for this time horizon, right? So now let's play a bit around um, and check out other assets. So first of all, let's take another time horizon. So let's take uh, 2015 here and just execute everything again. Yeah, we can get rid of these. So now you see these are the profits and if we are accumulating them, it is still not profitable, at least on HRB. This is important, right? Let's take a look at other assets. So Bitcoin. Would be profitable, quite a nice one, but you have to also take into consideration the buy and hold return, simply can take a look at the close, at a, uh, sorry, take the percentage change function at a one and take the cumulative product. This is the uh, return of the asset itself. So I've explained it in previous videos. I'm not going to into details here. And as you see, we have a way, way better buy and hold return of Bitcoin, even though the strategy seems kind of uh, nice here, right? 
Anyhow, let's check for um, Forex that we have some yeah asset classes covered. So this Euro USD. Okay, so looks interesting. Okay. Okay, that's insane. Okay, it seems to. So I'm 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 really cautious. Seems to be quite insane with a forex here. So if we're taking the development, yeah, you see this set development for the euro here, right? But yeah, insane returns on 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 forex. Have to yeah take a closer look at that. But anyhow, so I think in general this could be an interesting thing to yeah play a bit around with that so for instance we can uh, take a look at yeah uh, another uh, threshold here so take a look at 0 0.5 let's say for for bitcoin and just do some uh, yeah some some playing around with parameters here uh, just to give you an idea what what you can do with that so yeah this would would be better but still be outperformed. But maybe if we're taking a look at um, just the two last years. Yeah, you see the strategy might, might, I'm really cautious. So you see in the last uh, uh, two years or roughly two years, you see that we even be, uh, beat it or beat the uh, the buy and hold return, right? But uh, yeah, as said, so we could run that on all 1K stocks in the Russell in the next video. And I would actually be quite curious if this would work on the live crypto market. So would this work on uh, um, lower time intervals, like one minute, 15 minutes and stuff like that. I will do some research on that and will construct a trading bot out of that. So it's been a long time since I've done these videos. You seem to really like them. So let me know if you're interested in that. I hope this video was interesting, informative for you. And I thank you very much for watching and looking forward to see you in the upcoming videos. Bye bye.